Hi everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce keynote speaker Ed Snodgrass, nurseryman, author, and co-owner of Emory Knoll Farms Green Roof Plant. Ed is known across the world as a friendly and open soul with a ready laugh and is a highly sought after speaker. He's also pretty modest, but I have no problem talking about his virtues. So far he's co-written four popular books, which by the way you can order from our bookstore in the Expo Pavilion. And as you may know, Emory Knoll Farms was the first nursery in North America devoted exclusively to green roof plants. To date, they've provided about 4.5 million square feet of green roof plants to 703 projects and counting. Also, Emory Knoll Farms has a solid commitment to operating a sustainable business. And you can learn all about that later in co-owner John Shepley's presentation entitled Sustainability at a Small Business, Emory Knoll Farms. I've known Ed for over 10 years as an ecologically minded thinker and friend, and in fact, he was GreenRoofs.com's first contributing editor. And so we're thrilled to have Ed as one of our illustrious keynote speakers for our inaugural virtual summit. Ed will now share with you right plant, right place. Enjoy. Good morning. And welcome to Right Plant, Right Place. Um, it's an honor to be here speaking at this conference. Even though I can't see you all, I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be talking to you all and I uh, hope you enjoy the conversation about plants. There's an old landscape adage, Right Plant, Right Place, and that's our focus for today. Uh, in addition, we want to talk about not only right place, but right time, right scale, um, right geography. There's a number of things that go into having good plant success on green roofs. And as you can see from the slide, there are plants that are used for public spaces. This is an intensive green roof in London, actually at the World Green Roof Congress in London a few years ago. And you can see the plant choices here are around aesthetics and usability. There's lawn for recreation. And so this is a very, very different uh, use of plants on a roof than a traditional stormwater roof or a roof used for biodiversity. And we're going to go over some of those things today. Now, you can certainly have this, this kind of setup for green roofs, a public space, an occupied space. And because of the added loading, you can really have a high variety of plants trees, shrubs, lawns, those kind of things. So this would be a design intent for a public space. But some people just want to have green roofs up so they can be cool. Uh, this is the, the cool guy. So he has a green roof behind him in letters. Or you can have a green roof that matches a particular soil type and you can be at one with your soil. It's a very peaceful thing to be with soil as you can see from this man. But I think we have a lot of interest in using plants and soils to control stormwater in our urban areas. And stormwater has gotten to be such a problem that you see these signs all over the place that say, warning, don't get near your rivers, don't have contact with the river. And this is a prime driver of the green roof movement. Now, I think we have a lot of apocryphal information uh, people thinking that stormwater killed the dinosaurs. I've heard that floated. And even though there's photographic evidence of dead dinosaurs and green roofs, it is not necessarily true that green roofs killed the dinosaur. And this is an example of some of the green roof information that has been out there, uh, been promulgated, and it doesn't stand up to the science of green roofs. And what we need to do is have more science, more field data about how green roof systems work. And I think that we will find in time really appropriate plant selections. So this is Stuart Gaffin's work at Columbia University. Um, and he is doing real time measurements of green roofs in terms of stormwater performance and, and thermal performance, and also some plant performance. When we think about selecting plants for green roofs, we need to think about a range of things, the geography, the 
uh, amount of annual rainfall, the relative humidity, the application. So things like the Köppen-Geiger climate classification system are very handy for looking at uh, a lot of the climatic aspects for green roof systems and I encourage people to uh, to use that along with the hardiness zone maps. Now what if your green roof is on the move? You know, I mean, it, then you're crossing climates. This, this guy's car may be uh, going up into the mountains or down into the desert and he may have to change his plants out to suit the climate. But the kids are very excited here. Um, now you may see green roof plants selected as a part of uh, the architecture of a house. And here you see uh, a, a house in Steamboat Springs, Colorado with a green roof, mo mostly for ornamental reasons. Um, and I, I think that they have selected for a garden, essentially, on a roof. Or you may see at a big scale uh, a city like Stuttgart, which has a widespread green roof program for stormwater management. And in that case, you may see plants that are not chosen primarily for their ornamental qualities, but for their ability to live in very thin substrates to accommodate the building loads and become an economical way to manage stormwater over a large uh, amount of installations in square meters or acres, however you're calculating that. So one of the things that um, determines plants is also price and scale, as uh, the, this photo demonstrates. And then you have really highly innovative and, and interesting buildings. This is the Pixel Building in Melbourne, Australia. And they are trying green roof plants here. And the notion of this building is that it, the building can live independently of the grid, both in terms of water, sewage, uh, electricity, all the things that this, this building could be a self-standing building. And the green roof plants have to fit into that scheme. So you see this has attracted uh, political leaders from all over the world, and they're very interested in this kind of technology. What if we can build buildings that don't need to be hooked to the grid? What if they're independent? How do plants fit in with that? I mean, these are really uh, serious horticultural questions. So research is going on in this building through the University of Melbourne in Australia and looking at plant types that fit this particular building model. And you can see they're under these solar panels, so they're used for stormwater. They're also used to keep the surface temperature down to make the solar panels more efficient. And uh, they're just in their beginning stages there. So keep tuned on that one with the University of Melbourne and there may be some good data out in a couple years on plants um, and high performance buildings. Now the wonder, number one job of a plant on a green roof is to survive. If it, if it dies on the roof, it doesn't really do anybody much good. So there is a hierarchical um, look at green roofs. First they have to survive and then they can perform their function. So if you could have in the lab a very highly functioning green roof plant for evapotranspiration, but if it can't live independently on the green roof, then its physical properties don't really uh, matter that much. We can use plants for shade. This is a green roof in deep shade under uh, trees at a residential application, and you would look for plants that can also be drought tolerant, live in thin substrates, and also be able to live in shade. So those are that's a real critical uh, consideration. And it's a tough group of plants to find, plants that are dry shade plants, uh, and more work needs to be done on that. And then in climate, now this is a, uh, uh, a house in South Africa. So there are indigenous South African plants on this roof. And as you can see, they're not going to get a lot of water there. It's a Mediterranean climate, which means it has fairly wet winters and dry summers. So there's long periods of high solar radiation and no rain for months on, a, on end. And you can see that from the landscape, this is not in an area where there's a lot of city water to irrigate this roof. So these plants are going to be on their own. They have to be selected for that. But then they also have to be able to live through the wet winter period and um, so they have two different climates to adapt to. 
And this is at the Denver Botanic Garden. This is the research in Colorado. And then you have a similar climate to South Africa, but with winter temperatures that are much, much lower. So uh, I think in Denver, you can get 15, 20 below Fahrenheit and, uh, and 100 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer, which is about 38 Celsius. So you would see uh, a lot of solar radiation, a very low uh, humidity in the summer. So these plants would have to have a high adaptability to that that desert, high desert climate in uh, Colorado. Uh, they're probably under 25 centimeters of rain a year, and they get it uh, in in just a few months. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, you can have a place like uh, this is in Auckland, New Zealand. It's a very temperate climate, not a great variation of temperature year round. And so you would look for plants that would live in a more maritime setting. Um, the Tasman Sea is just over the hill there. And so very moderate temperatures, good annual rainfalls. And so you look for plants that can um, match up to that climate. And this is in, uh, in Australia in the, uh, at the World Heritage Site at uh, the Mount Toma. Uh, botanic gardens and th this is up in elevation a little bit in the mountains and these were all um, seed collected in the wild and then brought in so they're they're actually a genome from very close by um, some uh, perennial and grass species and uh, this is through the uh, the Sydney Botanic Gardens research so you can see there's going to be a lot of wind up there at the top of the mountain uh, it also gets below freezing and has long periods of drought. So I'm just showing you some of these from around the world to see how they approached uh, uh, their plant selection, what they're looking for, and just to give you some visual examples. There's another shot. You can see it's if there's any wind, it's going to be hitting it because it's the very top of the mountain there. Uh, and there's a small parapet, but not really not much. Uh, protection from the elements. So these plants have to be very, very tough. Now this is our um, little operation in Maryland in the mid-Atlantic of the United States. And we have evenly distributed rainfall. We live in a continental ecosystem. So we have um, hot and humid summers. Um, our winters are fairly dry, although statistically we have um, uh, about 10 centimeters of rain every month of the year. And, um, and, and we have uh, high humidity summers and very cold winters. So um, very much like the Asian steppes. So you see our roof in the background is also has to accommodate rainfall from uh, the roof above it. So it's actually getting almost twice the amount of rainfall uh, that it would if it were standing alone and at high velocity and high temperature coming off that metal roof. And there's a lot of seasonality with this roof. Um, so I want to show you um, uh, kind of walk through the year. So this is the roof in January. And you can see that the plants are not like they are in a lot of the marketing brochures. In the wintertime, the plants have died back to some pretty neutral and bland colors. Uh, you can see there's a little bit of a design on the roof that we, um, we maintain a little stripe of gravel in between there to highlight the design. And then in February, not much changes, but as we get into our springtime in March, you see a little bit of greening. Uh, the, uh, the colors are starting to come up. That There's some bulbs coming up, some uh, daffodils and crocus and tulips that we've planted. And then really by April, things are in full swing. You can see how dramatically different uh, the plants are. So when you choose plants, you can also choose them for their seasonality. And, and then May, things start to flower. Um, and June, things are, some things are still flowering. Um, and then by midsummer, uh, the roof has really come alive from all the heat and humidity and rainfall. August, it gets really hot and some of the plants suffer under the high heat and humidity, and we see that in the mid-Atlantic, certainly. And they take a little step back as we get into the height of summer. 
<clears throat> and then when the little bit of the coolness, early fall comes in in September, things start to rebound. Um, and then you can see some spent flowers toward the end of the month here uh, in October. And in November, uh, the fall colors come in. And then we're back to December when the, um, uh, the plants have gone into their dormant period. So you can see that even if you're selecting maybe only three species of plants, you can get a lot of different looks and you have to understand what, they, what the plants are going to look like 12 months of the year. That's a really important consideration. And how long they're going to live. You know, if you're going to put up a 50-year green roof, you don't want a series of three or four-year plants that you're having you go up and plant all the time. Keep in mind, everything is more work on a green roof than it is a green. It's a lot of work to get up and down on these buildings. So here you see a really big intensive roof in Asheville, North Carolina. It's got trees and grasses and shrubs and wildflowers and all that in the courtyard of this hotel is a green roof. There's a massage and spa a facility under there. So, you know, this is going to be gardened. These plants were selected um, as local native plants in the Appalachian region in the United States. So they were looking to build a native ecosystem here and have people out enjoying it um, and maybe they can get a nice relaxing spa treatment and sit out and have a beverage in their constructed native forest. And they can do the whole native plant palette because of their considerable soil depth. They're not constrained by um, um, soil depth like you would be on roofs in Stuttgart. Here again is that house in Steamboat, uh, a highly ornamental, um, you can see it just at a different time of day. And then there's the notion of food on green roofs. And there again, you're going to have to have your considerations of what do you want to, what kind of crops do you want? Do you want to have root crops? Do you want to have leafy crops? Uh, you may want to look at, you know, the air pollution in the area, you know, is there is there an atmospheric deposition of pollutants that you don't want on leaves that then you're selling? Or is it, uh, you know, what's your local market going to support? And then this particular roof is used for social work. So they're training urban kids in gardening and they're having them sell their produce into restaurants. And so they're getting a, an incredible farming experience in the middle of Chicago. It's, it's, um, a really important connection with the soil and with the plants and they're seeing where food really comes from and then they're getting the business experience of marketing that food into restaurants and uh, and other outlets farmers markets and so the kids are getting uh, a real chance to to empower themselves um, then there's a green roof this is in Adelaide Australia and they're actually using the green roof here uh, for an education uh, purpose. People are coming to camp at the zoo on the green roof and they have uh, classes at night around the zoo in ecology and biology and zoology of course and so they get to hang out on the green roof where they're, uh, they get, get to hear all the noises of the night in the zoo. So very interesting uh, application and Australian natives there as teaching tools in between the pavers. And here is a private residence, again looking out a bedroom window across a green roof. Um, and this is chosen, these plants are chosen for a couple reasons. One is it's, it's ornamental, but you'll notice they're also all very low maintenance plants. So they don't want to be out there gardening. They want to have a very uh, relaxed time if they want to go up and deadhead the alliums some those uh, or cut back the uh, flower stalks and the sedums but this is going to be a roof that's going to end up being kind of a succulent meadow with some accent plants and not a really high maintenance garden but at the same time they don't want to sacrifice all their aesthetics and they want to keep the um, um, the visual as high as they can and the work as low as they can.
this is in Sheffield. Um, this is one of the research areas uh, for Dr. Nigel Dunnett at the University of Sheffield. And this is a commercial building site. And Britain has a real garden culture. Um, so this is gardening up about four stories in the air. People can come out from work, enjoy the garden without having to spend a lot of time to walk to the park. Um, they can bring their lunch up. And so this is, at the same time, a very thin system, but because of England's favorable climate and the considerable horticultural knowledge of Dr. Dunnett, uh, it's a very highly variable um, green roof, lots of grasses and bulbs and perennials um, and succulents. So um, a very interesting approach. Now, I would, I would conjecture that unless this is really gardened, the biodiversity of this roof and the plant species will decline. There'll be winners and losers. Uh, the ones that are more aggressive will tend to occupy more space. The ones that are less aggressive, more fragile, will tend to go away. And this will have to be gardened to keep it like this. Now the other thing that you can look at at green roofs is just to make a, a building blend into the background. You can see the shape of the building is mirroring the shape of the hills in the background and this is uh, just east of San Francisco in California and this is um, California is known for their grassy hillsides and so these are grasses made to mimic that look and even to um, mimic the summer dormancy um, and then again in San Francisco is the San Francisco Academy of Sciences where the plants were selected for a biodiversity to supply larval food for um, for insects, for butterflies, uh, places for birds to go and, and snack on some insects that would be attractive to the plants. So they, they were California natives and then selected and it became part of their exhibit space at the Academy. So this is um, um, a collaboration between SWA Landscape Architectures and Rana Creek, uh, to, and uh, the architect was Renzo Piano. So a very interesting roof, and it's in an urban area, and it's part of a, uh, a science lab, as it were. And uh, I think lots can be learned by looking at places like this and see how they go over time. And then on a the smaller scale, you can certainly see that this is a tiny little uh, meditation hut in central Pennsylvania. So a little straw bale house. And again, the only way to get up there is a ladder. So the homeowner wants as high as ornamentation as, as possible, but very low maintenance. So um, I think this is the fourth year, and the owner told me, that last year they didn't go up to weed at all. So this is this year's photo and the plants have now kind of found their balance and maybe once or twice a year if there's something that comes in, a tree seedling or something that's unwanted, you can go up and remove it. But it has achieved a balance and it certainly doesn't look like the same group of plants that maybe it was planted with, but um, I think they're very happy with that because they don't need any more yard work there. And then you can see that plants for biodiversity, um, you have to understand which insects are around and how to, you know, what's attractive to them. And this is sometimes going to be a native plant, but sometimes a non-native. I mean, this is a honeybee in the U.S., and honeybees aren't native to the U.S., so it's getting pollen off the Stellosperma, which is a South African plant and there are uh, bees from Africa. So you're matching up uh, in the U.S. a, a honey bee and a non-native plant, but the, the plant is supplying bee, and you can see the little uh, dollop of pollen on the, uh, on the bee's leg there to take back and make some of the honey. And some of you that may be listening even get some of our green roof honey in the mail at Christmas. So uh, there's the start. And there's another honeybee on this time on a Native American plant, on a Tilinum calicinum. So, um, and you see it's got a big glob 
of nectar. It's getting into that plant and enjoying it very much. So by um, planting the right plants that are full of nectar and pollen, you will certainly get more insects. Um, and you can really have fun watching the insects come to the roof. But it's, it's a little bit, it's not safari stuff. You're on your hands and knees with a macro lens most of the time. Honey production on roofs, I think, is, is a real viable thing. I mean, especially in urban areas where your hives are away from any, from any kind of vandalism. They're away from uh, the bees being annoyed by people and traffic. And I think the roofs offer uh, a very res uh, quiet respite for the bees to do their work. And they can come and go. Uh, and, uh, and, the, and the roof is nice and cool with the vegetation. And also herbs on green roofs. Uh, uh, this is a restaurant in Vancouver, British Columbia that harvests their herbs. The chef and the gardener work together to select what they're going to grow and actually builds his menu off the available herbs for the evening meal. You can use green roofs on carports. Um, and um, this is uh, one of our employees, many, and uh, underneath a little very inexpensive green roof we built um, mostly to protect our farm equipment but I think we ended up protecting the Mini Cooper. And this is in Auckland, New Zealand at the uh, Auckland Botanic Garden where they're doing uh, research on green roof plants. They've selected two groups of plants I think to look at initially and that's New Zealand natives and also uh, plants from their South African collection there at the garden. So. Um, this is actually a, uh, a bathroom in the children's garden. And this is in London. This is a roof just for biodiversity. Um, all the different aggregates will attract different kinds of macroinvertebrates and insects. And so it's not only plants that vary, but sometimes just open media, sometimes little pieces of wood, and uh, and of course, variants in plants. So the design intent, you, as you can see from the presentation, is highly variable. Um, and then the plants need to follow that variability. There you see uh, areas with plants that are high in nectar next to a little pile of wood, which is going to attract uh, decomposing insects and, um, and maybe boring insects like bumblebees. Now, if you want to attract butterflies, you need two kinds of plants. You need the larval source, so the butterfly larva can eat that. And also, oftentimes, that's a different plant than the nectar source. Sometimes it's the same. But this is an Antonaria. Uh, that's the plant, and I don't know what species of butterfly that is. But then you get the adult, and it wants the nectar plants. So that's a different thing. So um, if you just put the nectar plants, you'll get the adults, but you won't get any multi-generational stuff. And you can see that pollinators love green roofs um, and they can perform a very high function. This is a salvia. Um, there's a damselfly. And then scale. This is a, uh, a green roof that's uh, about five acres on the Library of Congress uh, archive for film and audio in Culpeper, Virginia. And this is such an enormous undertaking that it has very little maintenance budget. And uh, so this has been designed for the plants to be um, secessional. So it started off as a very succulent roof and has ended up more toward forbs and grasses. And it's an interesting approach, I think, to try to think about the long-term ecology as you're introducing your plants. Now, you can work at all scales. You can start with birdhouses, um, and I think that's a great place to just experiment in your backyard if you're a little shy. Then you can graduate. This is uh, uh, a cat that's uh, that's been moved to the outside, and you can see it's got a nice little cat palace to enjoy with a green roof on top. And I think everyone can enjoy green roofs. They make people exuberant. And the plant choices just add to the exuberance. Take lots of chances with plants. Observe a lot. Stay the course. 
and look at them year after year and share your knowledge with your fellow plant people. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.